Welcome, and thank you for joining us in this awesome opportunity to hear straight from a literary agent. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our special guest today. Caitlin Johnson earned a BA in writing, literature, and publishing from Emerson College. She started her literary journey as a copy editor for academic publisher, Code Mantra. Caitlin is a former young adult editor for Accent Press. She was also a conference assistant for Grub Street, Boston. She has written several articles for Writer's Digest and has a flash fiction story that is published in an anthology called A Box of Stars Beneath the Bed. Caitlin Johnson has been a literary agent since 2016. You can find her at the Belcastro Literary Agency. She is also a content editor for Eichler Editing, and she is a freelance editor at her own company, Strictly Textual. She has several manuscripts which she's edited that are now published. Ms. Johnson is also a contributing editor for Revise and Resub, hashtag Rev Pitt, and is one of the founding contest members. Strictly Textual Dot com is where you can find Caitlin and see all of the editing services which she has to offer you that you can hire her out for. You can also reach her at Twitter at red 10 Caitlin. So I wanted you to know what an incredible resume our guest has and Caitlin is here to answer all of the questions that we are dying to know the answers to. So without further ado, let's bring on Ms. Caitlin Johnson. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, good morning. And thank you so much for coming with us and being able to do this. I'm so excited to have you. I'm excited to dive into these. You know, I'm, I love hearing from writers and trying to open up the industry just a little bit more. Yes, yes, yes. It's almost like a magical universe of its own that you kind of peek behind the window to try and see if you can figure it out. Exactly. It's that man in the curtain. Just don't pay attention to it. <laughs> so thank you for opening the curtain for us to help us to be able to navigate through some of this because all of us are on a journey. So tell me, are you a writer? I used to be a writer. I don't consider myself one right now just because um, with editing and with agenting, you know, I don't have a lot of time to work on my own stuff. And I'm pretty okay with that because I really love my editing and my agenting. Um, so I still have it in my life. I know eventually I'm going to go back to it, um, and finally have some interesting things to write about. But for right now, I really like the editing and that focus. Great. And when you do write, what genre do you write in? Is there a particular one? Uh, probably contemporary or fantasy. Um, those are the two that I was really focusing on and usually young adult, although I'm like really feeling middle grade lately. So who knows? Great. So I'm going to jump into that since you said the word contemporary. And if you want to go ahead and explain to our viewers what contemporary actually means. Definitely. So contemporary really means it's just real life right now. So it's, we, you know, it's set somewhere that is a realistic place, or at least um, if you're making a fake town, let's say it's in a real state or something like that, or a country. Um, and it's everyday things that are happening to everyday people. So it doesn't have magic. It doesn't have creatures or anything like that. It's usually <clears throat> like um, romance can be contemporary. Um, uh, some of the thrillers and stuff like that can be contemporary when it's set in modern day. Perfect. And what made you decide to switch from writing to wanting to be an agent? Um, I really enjoy the one-on-ones with, with authors um, to get on that creative side, to brainstorm and to find these new stories and be the first to read them and understand what a writer is doing. Um, I really, really enjoy it. I love, even the business side of it, I love connecting with editors and making my case for why I think that this book should be out there in the world. Um, I love writing, but I think I just feel uh, more, maybe more in control of the aspect as an agent or an editor, because it, again, I'm working with someone else's work and not my own maybe, a little less scary possibly. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm very nerdy. So I do love editing sides of things very much. Now is Belcastro Literary Agency, is that your first agency that you've worked for as an agent? It's my second. I was at Corvisiera Literary Agency since about 2016. 
Um, and I was an intern and went up to apprentice and then all the steps for junior and literary agent. Um, and I moved to Belcastro last year. So I just hit a little bit over my one year at Belcastro and I'm very much loving my team and my uh, coworkers and everything. Now, when you switch agencies, how does that work? So let's say I queried you and then I hear on Twitter that you moved to Belcastro. What happens with my query that was sent to you at the other agency? So for me, I use Query Manager, which is like a godsend because it helps everything stay organized very easily. So what I can do is go through all the queries I had and just do a template that says, I'm moving agencies, feel free to query me there um, when I announce that I'm open again. For people who get email in queries, I would hope you would like respond to them and try to get to it. Or I know some people when they've moved, they announce I'm moving here, but I'm going to finish up the queries in my inbox as well. So you don't need to resubmit or they'll just ask you to resubmit period. So it's dependent, but if they have query manager, it's really easy to just switch it right over. Nice. So when you query an agent, it follows that agent. It doesn't necessarily stay at that agency. Not necessarily. Um, it depends on how they run it, but most places okay. have individual emails for individual agents so that it doesn't get really confusing. Perfect. So are you open for querying? I am definitely open for queries. I have a lot of them, but I'm definitely open. I'm still very much on the hunt for great works. So when you, when somebody queries you, how long does it normally take for a response? I try to be no longer than three months. Usually I'm faster than that. Um, but I definitely get anxious myself when they're over three months, because I know as being a writer in the past, I know the stress and anxiety that happens behind that. So I try that, but I think writers need to remember also, if I read your query and I request it, that three months starts over again. It's not three months as in from query to full and to offer. Um, the time, the timestamp kind of resets itself every time I request more. Um, so yeah, I definitely try for that three months. I tell writers too, that if it's been three months, check in with author, with agents. Um, there's nothing wrong with checking in. If it's earlier than three months, that might be a bit soon. So if it's been say three months in a day, how would I nudge you appropriately? On Query Manager, it actually lets you, it'll like send you a confirmation when you query saying you have a query, keep this query, uh, keep this email response so that you can update the agent if anything happens or if you can check your status. And it'll have an option of emailing basically me through the system that says, just checking in, you know, um, if you've been able to review it or whatever. Um, for others, you can email the agent, just find it for the regular uh, email or you can like thread it with your old email, which is a lot more helpful because then we can find you. So it's really just about, you know, um, just checking in to see if you've had a moment, a moment to review my book. I am looking forward to your thoughts. Just something brief and simple. Perfect. So let's go ahead and we'll jump into the manuscripts. Okay. So what is a balance that you look for in a manuscript or MS between dialogue and action versus narration? I think dialogue needs to be used sparingly. I see it a lot where it fills up a page too much and I lose focus of learning who the characters are. I feel like I'm being talked at instead of being part of the story itself. So I really love to see a good chunk of prose and narration. And I adore it when it's like got the voice of the character built into it. It doesn't feel like the author kind of telling the character story and the character jumping in every so often, um, which is hard to explain how to do obviously. Um, but I prefer a decent chunk of the prose and the narration and then dialogue where it's necessary or where it's teaching us or leading us somewhere. Um, it's very hard to know with dialogue, you know, what to use, what to not use. So I think it shows a, a, somebody who's very well crafted when they know what's helpful and what's just filling space. Great. And then what's the difference between the amount of dialogue that one uses in a novel versus a screenplay? So screenplay is pretty much all dialogue. You've got your bits where you're giving us either what a scene's supposed to look like or the movements of a character, but it's usually going to be just lines of dialogue. Um, the, the novel should be less dialogue than everything else. It should be very, again, it should be used sparingly um, and it should be purposeful 
everything else is going to be prose or description or uh, internal thought or anything like that. Uh, screenplays don't get internal like that. They're just going to be, this is the setting, this is what the person's doing, here's the text, here's the text, here's the text, um, here's they move to here, here's the text, here's the text. So you're just <laughs> going to get a bunch of dialogue in it. Great. And then speaking of internal thoughts, there's a lot of writers that have questions about that because it's done so many different ways. What is the appropriate way in a manuscript to signify internal thought from a character? For me, it's italicized. Um, if, it's, if we're in an actual internal thought where they're kind of thinking something to themselves, so ergo thinking it to the reader, it should be in italics. Um, quotation marks are for dialogue. Uh, single quotation marks are for like quotes within a quote. And that's different for UK and US style, so go research. Um, but yeah, I, I always say if it's a flat, especially if it's like a flashback too, normally that's gonna be formatted differently than the rest of the text so we know what we're doing. But if it's just a line where they're just like talking to themselves randomly or thinking about something, it's gonna be in italics. Note to self. Exactly. When, when somebody, <laughs> yes. So the other question that I have is something that you just talked about is when you have a flashback. So you're talking in, let's say somebody is thinking about something and all of a sudden their brain goes off to when they first met this person. So then you would want that um, signified differently by how? So that's a different form. I should have been a little clearer. Um, so that's there's okay. different kinds of flashbacks. There's more of like a memory of like when you're in the moment and you see somebody and you're thinking back on like when you met them. And then there's an actual flashback where you set aside a spot to like give us an entire scene um, so it varies. If you're actually going to be setting aside a big chunk of sec, like a section of text that's specifically a flashback, as in we're going back and reliving the whole moment, that's italics. If it's just like a paragraph and they're kind of giving you a little bit of backstory on how they met or something like that, like, oh, I remember when we went out to dinner for the first time and you had the wine and I had the beer, um, that won't be in italics because it's, it's this brief kind of flash and then we come right back to the main scene. Perfect. Yay. So what are your feelings on first person with more than one point of view or POV? Super hard to do. So hard to do um, because your characters have to have unique enough voices that if we didn't have a signifier at the beginning of each chapter telling us whose mind we're in, we need to be able to see that just from the text. And it's really hard to do that in first person because you're going to be so internal. You're going to be giving us internal thought. You're going to be giving us lots of dialogue or emotion. Um, so having different characters in first person, it's really easy to start confusing who's who. Um, and they fall flat. They start falling a little bit 2D instead of being fleshed out in 3D. So it can be done, but it's very difficult. So how many POVs can be in a single chapter? would you recommend? Only one should be in a single chapter. Like if you're telling it from one perspective, that's the chapter. So then the next chapter will start off with your, your, um, your other POV, your next person. There should never be two in one because it basically becomes head hopping. And A, it's very confusing. Um, but B, it also kind of limits what you're able to do with voice. And building those characters your head it's head hopping feels more cinematic than it does novelization okay and which is more desired in today's marketplace first person or third person narrative i think it depends on the story because i always say like there's some i don't let, prefer but if it, it'll work for your story because it kind of just goes along with it i tell people to rewrite their first chapter both are different ways see what works, see what makes you super uncomfortable. Um, me personally, I really like third person past tense. I just feel, I don't know, I feel more inclusive. I feel immersed in the storyline. I really like that. But there's, you know, first person's present tenses that are amazing. I can't stand third person present tense. And I say that, but a client of mine is writing one right now that's really good. And I was just like, well, okay, you, uh, you made me a liar. <laughs> but so it, it really is dependent on the story. I even have a client who has first person for one POV and second person for another POV. And it's coming out um, this year, actually. But it blew me away. And I've never seen it done like that. And I was just like, so POV can really just wow people. 
So there shouldn't be too many expectations on it. It should just be what feels right to your story. Great. And so we're going to touch a little bit further because a lot of writers have asked, what is your viewpoint on tense in a manuscript? So it needs touched to touch on a little bit. Yeah, it needs to stay consistent. If you're bouncing back and forth where for one, sh one paragraph you're using present tense and then all of a sudden you join, you go into past tense in the next paragraph, that's, that's incorrect. That's going to be grammatically incorrect and it's going to be a kind of a red flag. Um, obviously it's not a huge like mandatory, oh, we're going to re re reject you now. Um, but if it's happening enough, it may become hard to read. So try to keep your, your tenses consistent throughout the book. And preferably past tense. Preferably for me, past tense. But again, if it's first person present tense, That's third person different. present tense is really hard to edit, just saying, because you have to keep your mindset in that present tense, but third person makes you want to go to past tense. It's so hard to edit. Um, but again, I have read some books that just did it marvelously. Great. So if you have hist a historical fiction, should you also say that it's commercial or literary or smart? And can you explain the difference in those? So I don't know what smart is. Um, me neither. <laughs> I've never had an editor tell me smart fiction. I feel like it might go more towards like thriller or suspense or something. I'm not sure. Um, literary, it's more that it's not. So, so commercial is for the masses. It's got broad appeal. It's not as niche. Um, literary often gets a little more internal. It possibly is much more character driven than plot driven, just dependent. Um, and literary often uses a lot more prose. I feel like commercial, we definitely get more dialogue and we get more internal thought and stuff like that sometimes because again, it's going to be, act, it's either going to be plot driven or character driven in a way that everybody kind of bond, like understands the characters. Literary is a very different sphere. Um, there's also like lyrical writing, which is a kind of a blend. It's like upmarket, I guess. Um, but like Water for Elephants is considered upmarket, which has got like a lyrical tone um, where the writing is commercial. It still appeals to broad masses, but it's got a little bit of that more focused direction that you want the voice to go to, I, I guess. You have like a purpose behind the voice instead of it being a natural voice. It's really hard to, this is why I don't do a lot of literary <laughs> fiction. It's hard to describe. You're doing great. And <laughs> for me, the, the um, examples that you're using, I've read the books, so I know exactly what you're talking about. And if you've not read Water for Elephants, please go read it because it's an awesome book. Really good. Yes, it was good. So smart, and there's that smart word again, another writer asked, what is smart commercial fiction? So I'm assuming if we go with commercial fiction, hopefully we'll. Yeah, I, the only thing I can think of for smart possibly is maybe just like, it's got sharp dialogue and very focused characterization. There's not a lot of wiggle room or evolution in it. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I've not talked to an editor about smart. So maybe now I'm going to do some homework too. Okay. No worries. So when you're setting out your genres for your manuscript, whose responsibility is that to set the genre? Uh, the writer should know what they're writing. Um, they should already basically have done their homework, understand their own genre, because it also shows that they know how to market their own book. They know where it would be put on a shelf. If, and there are discrepancies. I mean, if you have fantasy with sci-fi elements, excuse me, um, sometimes it's really hard to understand which genre you have, or if you have a genre blend, like a paranormal romance or something like that. Um, there are ones that are very tricky, which I think is where beta readers come in a lot of help because they can help you maybe figure out your genre um, and researching other books that are like your book and seeing where they, they fall. It shouldn't be expected, well, when you submit, you know, I'm sending you my novel that is this many words, thank you. And I'll be like, what's the genre? I don't, you should be telling me that already. I can help you down the road, but I should know you have a base idea. So if uh, you get a query and it's obvious that the writer doesn't know their genre, is that an automatic pass for you? Not necessarily, but it is a red flag. Um, I do keep that in mind. Um, if you don't know your own genre, like you just don't say it at all. Or if you told me it was a, 
Oh, you told me it was a fantasy, but it's set in the real world. And I'm like, that's not a fantasy. That's, you know. Mm-mm. Um, so it, it depends on, I think, the pitch. If the pitch is also not good, then I just may be like, okay, yeah, it's not for me. So when you're writing, it's considered your craft as a writer. And so it's our job to make sure that we know what our craft is and what's required. So part of your learning your craft would be to research the different genres and to know what they are so that you know what's expected because every genre has different things that are expected of them in a manuscript such as romance one of the main criteria of a romance is how does it end yep. it has to, it have, has a to have a happily ever happy after end. yes it has to have a happily ever after so if i'm querying a romance to you but they all die in the end. That's not a happily ever after. Well, that's so going to be a you, different book. <laughs> yeah. But that's why it's important to know what your genre is. So if you get a query and it's got like, say, I, I, I see some writers that have like seven genres and it's like, yeah. what, is your, what is your first thought? <laughs> you don't know what you wrote. The, and second I see that, I'm like, you don't know what you wrote. And usually it's because they pick up these tiniest little elements. They're like, oh, it's a mystery. And I'm like, it's not a mystery just because someone died. Like, and you don't know who. It's not, that doesn't make it a mystery. So you have to research what genres actually are. Um, And I get it when you're genre blending and you get confused on what's, I always say, pick the genre that your book is most heavily in. And then you can say with elements of such and such. So if it's got a romantic storyline, but it's not a romance, don't say romance. You can say this is a fantasy with a romantic subplot or with romantic plot elements. That's my way. I like that. Yeah, I cheat the system a little bit in that way because it shows you like, you know your main genre and you know the trickle of the trickle off bits basically. Um, But most of the time you're not gonna be using that because you you are gonna fall into an actual genre. Great, but I'm going to say that again because that was really cool and I've not heard that before. So this is a fantasy with romantic subplots. So that was kind of a cool way to put it. So I like that. Yay. So let's go ahead and jump into talking about editing your manuscript. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Are there certain types of, for your company that you do, are there certain genres that you edit and others that you don't, or you'll edit any genre? So I here. normally, I, I do specialize in certain ones. So I specialize in like a fantasy and romance, um, not as much sci-fi if it's very technical. Um, that's really hard to edit and usually goes over my head. So I'm an octopus, but um, contemporary, obviously, uh, historical fiction. Those are the ones I usually specify and I have them on my site. Um, but I like don't do nonfiction really. Um, I'm I I am open to like proofreading it or something like that. But I'm I'm not nonfiction person. I don't really do suspense or thrillers very often or mystery like whodunits. Um, I don't do short stories or poetry. Um, I can do picture books, and it's usually just the pitch for the query. I can do queries for almost any genre just because you're still going to be doing the the basics of your book, um, and you're doing a pitch. When it comes to genres I don't specialize in, it's when I get into the, the full length manuscript edits that I'm like, I'm probably not the right fit for this one. And it's important because if it's your genre that you normally do, then you know the different pros and the different things that belong in there to make it that genre, correct? Exactly. Okay. So at what point should a writer have their manuscript or think about having their manuscript edited? So for professional editing, it's never mandatory because we all know it's expensive. Not everyone's going to have that budget. Um, Some people just can't depend on stuff like that. Um, But I think it's definitely going to need to be after you have finished it, you've gone through multiple beta readers, edited off of the beta readers, um, and you feel like it's at a point where it's almost ready for publication. Um, Because the, the editors should be your last line of defense kind of thing. We should be the ones getting it ready to be submitted to your agent or to an editor or something like that. Some people try to get freelance editors really soon in the process, like first few drafts, and it's a waste of money because you're going to get changes and you're going to edit it and then you're going to need to do it all over again instead of it being, okay, this is almost ready, going to get all the notes I can just to make sure it is as 
polished and tight in plot as possible. And then it's going to go out to agents after I finish all of that. Um, that's what you should be focusing on, not your early drafts or going to an editor. And if you want an editor because you're like, I really just don't know what's wrong and I know it's not ready for publication, but I need help on this, then that's your prerogative and they will still help you with that and that's fine, but you may need another edit down the road so, so you can fix multiple issues then. Um, but yeah, usually it's going to be that last line of defense kind of bit. Great. And then if you pay a professional editor to edit your manuscript, how should that writer handle their critique when they first get it back from the said editor? I say give it a few days to a week, set it aside, percolate, like take it line by line, like little section by section, because you're going to get a lot of information all at once and it's going to be overwhelming and it's personal. It's writing. We all are very personal with our stuff. So it's go not going to feel great at first. Um, and a lot of that's going to have to do with you needing to step aside and re and take it from a different standpoint that is now becoming a business standpoint. We, the editor is looking at this as, okay, what advice and suggestions can I give to make this sellable? Because that's what they're coming to me for. I'm teaching them how to polish and fix writing and fix issues that may be something an agent or editor will turn it down for. We're not looking at it as creative and it's your project and it's this amazing world you've created and like it's so cool and let's up the fandom aspect of it. That's not how an editor's thinking about it. So when you get your feedback, you have to think of it in the business standpoint is that they're giving the feedback because that's what their their focus is. Um, that being said, not everything an editor says in, a, in the feedback is law. There are elements where you can say, I really don't like this piece of feedback because I have a specific focus for this. Um, this is not what I was trying to do with my story or with my character. So you can say no, just make sure you're not saying no because you're like, well, it was a fun thing to write or I just really like that character or that scene. If you're gonna say no, you need a strong argument for why you are pushing back against that stuff. Um, and a helpful bit to know that you're going to work well with the editor, obviously, is when you first start, ask them for a sample edit before you hire them. Um, some will do it. Some, if they, if they ask, straight out say no, that's kind of a red flag to me. Some will say, I can do a sample edit, but here's my fee. And then if you hire me, we take that fee out of your overall amount. So you're not paying twice or something like that, because they are still giving their time to be editing for you. Um, but yeah, if they don't offer it at all, that's a red flag because how are you going to know this editor gets your voice? Um, is if, are they tough love and you're just not a tough love person? Do they do compliment sandwich? Like I do where, you know, they, they give you the pros and the cons and try to give you suggestions. You need to know that you guys will vibe a little bit and it's not just going on blind faith. And is it okay to interview different editors? Definitely. It's no, it's no different than when you're trying to send out to agents. You're not going to send one out to one agent and just wait. You're going to be querying multiple agents at the same time. So when you're hiring an editor, you should research and look at people and talk to them and uh, make sure you're making the right business um, discussion. Because again, if you like them and they do very well with you, you could be hiring them for future projects. So you want to make sure that you, you, do your homework and find that match for your, for your work. Perfect. So if, and there are all different types of editors there are all different levels. There are some editors that you can find out there that will do it less expend, expensive than say your Brenda Copeland's um, that are, you know, very famous and do a lot of famous writer editing and stuff. So, but is there a happy medium in there somewhere or just because somebody's going to charge you say $450 for an edit, but you can see some of the other things that they've written. How do you know if that's an okay person or not? Because I've heard good and bad stories. You know, I've yeah, heard horror exactly. stories where, okay, it cost me $500 and all they did was put it through a word document. They did a what? Yeah. So, and then there's others that they paid that and they did a fantastic job for that genre because they've also written several books in that genre. So, I mean, what are, how do you weed some of this out so that you don't get stuff? Yeah, I, I always caution people, don't just hire an editor because they're an author. 
Um, because just because they can write their own book doesn't mean they can edit somebody else's book. Um, that's a lot of what agents do is we edit it for them or with them. Um, you also need to check their background of what other things they've worked on. Did they go to school? I mean, it's, it's same as agenting. You don't need a degree technically to be a freelance editor. Um, but check if they do, have they had internships and publications bits? Have they done copy editing? Um, Cause anybody can wake up and just call themselves a freelance editor and lowball prices to just try to make some money. Um, so you definitely need to do the background work of figuring out who they are, who they've worked with before. And normally they're gonna list titles on their sites of people they've worked with who've been published. So you can go and you know reach out to those authors if you can. That's not always the easiest way of doing things. Um, check out those books and be like, well, this doesn't, <laughs> take that with a grain of salt because again, not every author is going to take all of our changes. Um, right. But, but yeah, you just need to make sure that they have some kind of presence and experience because if they don't, I mean, they have to start somewhere, but you have to make the right decision for you. So if it's somebody who just seems to pop up randomly into the sphere and is really giving low prices, maybe second guess that just to be like, well, this person could just be doing it to pay bills and actually doesn't have the qualifications for it. Because like when I hire an editor like yourself through your company, um, strictly textual, and I like what you did with my book, I get an agent, I get it published. Hopefully I'll go back to you for the genres that you do because we work so well together. And that's, I'm assuming what an editor is also hoping as well, that if you work well with a writer, that you would want them to come back to you again for future works. Exactly. We love return customers because we, again, you also get their voice. You start understanding how to edit for them. It's not just a blank sheet editing process. It's you leave certain elements alone because you know that's how a writer does something or that's kind of their writing style. So you, as an editor, you're also evolving to the writer's work, not just editing it the way you think you would edit your own work. Um, so having return people is amazing because you also obviously get to pad that resume and be like, hey, I have this person who's been publishing constantly or consistently. Um, but it's, it's a trust thing that you have a writer that you know how to work with and you have a writer who trusts you to come back to you. Um, so it's definitely the goal is to keep people, you know, coming back and working with them. And you help the writer grow as a writer too. Cause I feel like editors, it's not just readying your piece. We're also making changes in a way that teaches you different elements of writing. Um, so like if you didn't know a lot about grammar or something like that, um, an editor is going to be making these changes and you can learn from them for your next book. So it's always a really cool relationship if it continues. Which is one of the reasons why they say sometimes when you have a manuscript with an agent that's out, that they're shopping, that sometimes you don't get that first debut one done. Sometimes it might be your second or your third one because each manuscript you learn more and get better. Exactly. That happens to multiple of my clients. We didn't get their, their first book that I signed them on, didn't get published, but their second books did because they grew as writers and they, they got I don't want to say better because obviously they were good. That's why I signed them and I loved them. <laughs> um, but, you know, they grew as a writer. Their craft embellished. It just got more mature. They'd learned more and they'd learned how to flourish their style more. So it happens all the time. And I'm also going to point out that there are a lot of professional writers, Stephen King for one, that hires an editor and has his manuscript edited before he sends it to his agent. Wow. Which agents prefer. <laughs> don't, don't send an agent a first draft, please. Oh God, no. No, and I don't mean edited by just himself. I mean, he's done his mm -hmm. own work, but he, he pays a, um, an actual editor. Um, yeah, I've done to, that for a lot of writers who have agents. I, I edit for them as well. I just edited somebody's middle grade who has an agent that's a friend of mine. But, um, and that's always fun too, just because not every agent is editorial. And so if you're looking for that, but you really love your agent and you guys work really well together, you can have a freelance editor edit for you despite having an agent. Like you don't get an agent and just think everything's good. Just everything's like, you don't have to work anymore. Just saying. It's the next step. Exactly. <laughs> so let's say I have 
I have your, um, the edits back and I've gone, I gave them some rest and I've gone through them and I've done what I can, but I have some questions about something because it didn't quite resonate with me or I wasn't sure. Is it okay to contact that editor and say, Hey, I don't understand this or will this work better or what have you? I always allow them to ask questions through email um, to a reasonable point, obviously. Um, and that is something to ask before you hire them too, is if they're, are they open to questions, brief questions or anything like that? Because it's text. So some things may not translate as well or be as clear as you want. So I always tell them, you know, shoot me questions if you want me to clarify or flesh out some ideas. If they really want to have like an in-depth talk, I charge like a 50 bucks for a half an hour to get on a call and to really go over things or to chat more about something else. Um, so it should be allowed, it should be very much accepted that you can ask questions because it's hard to just get feedback thrown at you and then that's it, it's a brick wall, you just go from there. So I would think an editor would always be open to that. With boundaries. With boundaries, yeah. They're not looking for you to send them like a six page email of questions. <laughs> Definitely. So our, our manuscript or MS is ready. It's polished the best that I can possibly get it. And I've had it edited. Um, before I had it edited, I had beta readers read it to make sure that it was on point and where it needs to go. They felt it was ready. So I paid for an editor. I got it all ready. I've done all the rewrites. Everything's good. It's been polished. Now it's time for the query. So we're going to jump into that really quick. So would you say that a query is more of a logical exercise versus a creative one, or is it kind of a dance between the two? I think it's more of that blend. It's, it's, you need to figure out what your marketing hook is, what makes yours unique, but you also want to give the pitch in a way that is enticing, that is engaging. Um, it's going to make the, I, I call them like the teaser trailers, um, cause it gives you just enough information to know what's possibly going on or the character and the conflict and the stakes at, at hand for that. But it's vague enough that we're like, okay, I want to, I want to see where this is going. So I think it's a good blend. And again, people think that they don't need readers for their query. Cause they're like, they read my manuscript. All right, now I'm just going to do the pitch. But I think it's even more important sometimes to get a query beta read because if things aren't clear or if you're rambling or if the entire thing's a bio, your readers can tell you that. They can be like, what? I, this is not the story I read from you. Um, what are you doing? So it's great to have them look over that as well. Perfect. And what structure do you like to see a query put into? I love to see the first paragraph as like the metadata with is the title and the word count and the genre and everything. Because for me, I like to know exactly what I'm about to dive into. Um, and then for the, the next paragraph, I like to see the Oh, introduction of the first character and the opening situation they're in. Next paragraph is the conflict that they face. You know, what is the thing pushing them out into the rest of the world? That's the main prerogative of the story. The next paragraph is the stakes. So what's at risk? What's their goal? If they don't say fail or succeed, like what, why do we care about this? And then your bio. It's just short and sweet and nice. And it's obviously an evolving structure. You can kind of cherry, cherry pick it Jerry rig it, Jerry rig it. <laughs> I can talk. Um, you can, you know, reform it to fit your story standard. It doesn't have to be that perfect structure, but those are the key elements. I always say is character conflict and consequences um, and show what makes yours unique. If yours, your, your book is sitting on the shelf. What makes me want to pick that one up rather than the one next to it. Now, when, how many words would you say is pretty normal for a query? I normally don't go by word count. I think it's somewhere around 350-ish or something like that. But I mean, it just needs to fit on a page and it can be single spaced. Um, but I usually say, you know, it should be like no more than five or six paragraphs and like okay. basic, basic paragraphs, not huge ones. Now, is there a different criteria for say picture books? Not for picture theory? books. Yeah, picture books are actually very similar um, in that you're still just going to be pitching the character what's facing them and maybe what's at risk at the end or the lesson that they learn at the end. It may be a bit shorter because you're not going as in depth on something because it's a shorter plot, obviously, uh, but it's not very much different. The only thing that's super different would be um, 
like a graphic novel proposal or a nonfiction proposal. Those are very, very different things. Okay. And then with a graphic novel, what is the difference between a graphic novel and a picture book? So graphic novel normally is you're still going to have the same pitch kind of thing, but you're also going to have this very detailed fleshed out synopsis of basically everything that's going to be happening in the story. Um, because with graphic novel, you don't have to have it finished yet to pitch it to us. So we need to see that you have the whole story planned or a direction you're going. And then often people, if, if they're illustrators or they have some sample art, that will also be included in it. Um, for picture book, you know, you're not really gonna have a synopsis. It's maybe a little bit of explanation, but again, it's gonna be very similar to your pitch. So your synopsis may be just like a few paragraphs because again, nothing, it's not going to be going that long because it's not a long work. Um, exactly. Sample text, that's about it. So graphic novels, much more kind of in-depth materials. So can you go ahead and uh, query a picture book or a middle grade book if you don't have the illustrations to go with it, if you just wrote it, but have no illustrations or vice, and vice versa? Mm -hmm. um, ooh, the vice versa part's hard. Um, if you don't okay, have we'll the take the <laughs> if you don't have the illustrations, that's fine. Um, a lot of publishing houses either they have illustrators on their roster kind of thing that they work with a lot, or they may yeah they may have somebody to team you up with stuff like that. You don't have to be an author illustrator or have stuff already. Same with a graphic novel. Um, for the other, there, for illustrators, there are agents who take on just illustrators and there are publishing companies who hire just illustrators and pair them with works. Um, it's, I don't, I don't, I don't represent illustrators alone that are just illustrators because I'm, I'm not as practiced in that sphere, but there are certain pitch contests I know and there are certain ways of reaching out to get an agent strictly for your illustrations. Um, so it would depend on the agent who's taking that in. Okay. And then I have another writer who wanted to know, her main character is a, is a 13 year old. Should she, should the genre of this manuscript be middle grade or young adult, which is YA? So first off it's, um, age category, because genre is going to be fantasy, contemporary, anything like that. Age category is going to be middle grade, young adult, adult, all of that. Um, for 13 year old, that's pretty much going to be middle grade. Um, it would depend on the themes because sometimes 13 has been pushed up into YA just because either there's a darker, more mature theme going on, or there's, you know, abuse of some sort that isn't, is handled in a more graphic nature. Um, but normally your 13 year old is going to be in middle grade. Uh, 14 is the one where I'm like, uh -huh, it's a shadowy area. Nobody seems to know. Um, 14 can go either way half the time. And that's why we see so few 14 year old protagonists right now. Oh, that's interesting. So what should a writer take into consideration when they're trying to figure out what agents to send their manuscript to? They should do research on, you know, have they published any titles before? who are their clients, what place they work at, if they're a newer agent, because again, we all have to start somewhere. So there's nothing wrong with newer agents, but see who their mentors are. Who, what is the history of the agency itself? Have they had drama on social media? Have they had some questionable or unethical practices? Um, if you are getting an offer from an agent, ask to see a blank contract so that you can look over that contract. Um, talk to their clients if you can. If, you, if they don't offer you, you know, and remember you need to keep it in mind of either maybe the authors won't answer your email or they've asked their agent not to give out their emails. Um, so be wary of that. But you just definitely need to be looking at what they're doing, social media wise especially, because we can say anything in, in uh, interviews. We can say anything on our lists, but it's our actions half the time, you know, or rumors about people that tell us the real thing. So do the digging, go on absolute right and see if anybody's started a forum on the person or on the agency themselves. Cause if there's an agency that has issues, the agent may be having a hard time getting out of that agency for one, but you have to think of these are the people who are educating them and teaching them how to be an agent. So that's something to definitely think about. So since you touched on social media, 
how important is social media for a writer and should they be careful of some of the things that they do post on social media? Do social you look media. into that? When I, when I, when a writer queries you, do you check out their platform? I always check out their platform. Um, cause I want to make sure they're not bullying. They're not being a jerk. There's no unethical things going on. Um, and that's not saying obviously we're censoring you because we're not, you can still put up your beliefs and all of that's fun stuff. Um, it's more about how you're interacting with people, how you are, like, are you going into attack mode on comments and stuff like that? Is no one allowed to say different than you? Because that makes me think, oh, if they look at the reviews for their book that gets published, are they going to go start a fight? Um, so it's really important. I don't think it's important in that you have to have a billion followers or anything like that, especially not in fiction. Um, but it's really important for social media to act like it's still a business face. You have decided you're an author. You are going to be in the public eye you're going to be scrutinized like people in the public eye are. So your Twitter is no longer, or your Facebook or whatever, it's no longer just a personal thing. It's not something to go venting on or anything like that. It really is an image of who you are as an author to your audience. That's where your audience is going to find you. So we do look at that. And it's no different than if you guys go look, research me and look on my posts. And I, you know, I try not to talk too much about a lot of fights and stuff like that, but I do still speak my mind. So you're allowed to do that, obviously. You just have to find that balance of you're not attacking people. You're not bullying anybody. You're not clearly being a jerk because we're not going to want to work with you if that's the case. Yep. So when you see a query, is it more attractive to you as an agent to see that this is a standalone or it is a one in a series, first in a series? It's, it's more attractive that it's a standalone, depending on the age and the genre. Um, middle grade is, is doing much better with series, technically. Um, but we do see standalone with series potential, which is basically, you know, the first book, if no other book gets sold after it, it can still stand alone. It can give us answers to questions that give us closure and satisfaction. So it can still be just fine if a series is never made. Um, if you need to go to book two, to finalize the plot or answer questions or something like that. As in, if I end book one and I'm like, literally like, okay, I don't know what happened to this. And like, I have to, because that was a main part of the first book. I have to go to book two. Then it's the first in a series. It's the first in an intended series. Um, again, you can just say stand alone with series potential. If you're like, well, it doesn't have to be a series, but it can do that because I think most most titles can you can say that about because there's secondary characters and there's subplots and all that but I think appealing wise standalone is usually appealing just because it's not dependent on something else so if somebody wants to buy the first one and then they decide they don't want to buy the second and third is that going to harm sales or something like that right and then when you're writing a, a query and if it's your debut novel, should you say that inside the query? And how should you write it? Some people, grammatically, some people wanna know, do you put, um, this is my debut, semicolon, or um, should you just use that, my debut novel, my debut manuscript, da 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 da. Definitely it just could be debut manuscript, da 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 da. Um, there's no, punctuation needed or anything like that. Um, and it is helpful to say debut. Um, it is nice to know, like say if we're doing that, it's not mandatory because obviously if I like it and I'm gonna talk to you, I'll ask you if you've published anything else or if you've self-published anything. Um, but yeah, if it's your debut, go ahead and definitely say that um, cause it only help. And should you put your word count in there? Yes. Always, if your word counts on in there, I'm gonna be like, I need to know this. If you have a middle grade and it's 100,000, that's wrong. I'm going to reject it, sorry. Um, so I need to know that. Okay, and when you're, do you like comps in a query? And if so, where would you put the comps? Would you put them in the beginning, the first paragraph, where you also put like your debut with the name of the novel and the, the genre and the word counter, where would you put the comps at? Um, yeah, comparison titles would go up in that paragraph. Oh, some people put them at the end and I'm, I think just, just put it all the metadata together. Um, I don't put too much stress on comparison titles just because I'm really bad at them as well. I know how much they suck, 
but if you have, it is better to have none than to have bad comparison titles. Um, comp titles are really hard. So don't just be pushing together big blockbuster titles. Like don't be like Lord of the Rings meets uh, Mortal Instruments or something. Like there's a million things you can pull from those titles and they're the big hot shots. You're claiming a lot about your book to say that you can measure up to like that when you're a debut writer. Like find ones that are really actually focusing on something that is mirrored in yours and you can do like a big blockbuster title but then um, a small one or you can do like an older book meets a newer book so showing how you're blending it like it shouldn't your titles technically should be no more than five years old um, unless you're doing the new book meets the old book and showing how you're clashing those I love when people give me something that's like it's the I gotta think about it. It's the um, family strife of this book meets the lyrical writing of this author or something like that. Um, so you're giving me the exact elements you've pulled from these stories. And you can also do things that aren't books, as long as you at least keep one book in there. Um, you can do video games, you can do movies. Uh, I'm blanking on whatever media there is, but you can do different kinds of things. You don't have to stick to just novels. So if you use a, a movie, a TV show, a video game, anything, a song um, that's not a book, because a book you want within a certain amount of time, a recent, not from the 1940s, but one of the other medias, you can, can you use older or does all of your comps have to be within the last three to five years? I think you should have at least one because you're showing that you know the marketplace still and you know what's still going to be grabbing the people of now not the people in 1940. Um, like if you're using a title that's like say from 1940 and that you can be like this is a revamped version of such and such to make it the modern style um, because we also need to know that we can sell it to people today um, that people are interested in it today so if you're using all of these things that are 20 years or older we're going to question how it's relatable to the audience of now. So let's say your manuscript is set in 1974. Would you want comps that are considerable to that? Or you still want present day comps, but to say that, do, would you say that your novel set in 1974 or you just let them find that out when they- You would definitely say when it's space? set. Yeah, if you're doing okay. historical, definitely say when it's set. Um, and I think that's a great moment to have the blend of old and new. So you could say it's like Count of Monte Cristo meets this title that was published like two years ago um, or like the intrigue of this title or something. Um, because like, yeah, we're still trying to say, okay, this is historical, we get that. But what about it is gonna be relatable to audiences now? Um, we still have to think of it in that lens despite it being set in the past. And when you're looking up comps, let's say I can't figure it out, I can't think of a movie, I can't think of anything to do it, is it best to just not put any in the query? Yeah, it's better to not put anything than put bad comps. Like I don't wanna be seeing, again, Lord of the Rings meets like Mortal Instruments or something um, because you just really like them and you're like, oh, mine has demons, cool. I'm like, no, that's not, that, that's not a, a, a good comparison because comp titles become very important once you have an agent because editors love to see them. Editors think in that sales brain. So it's definitely going to be, it's going to be a factor coming up. It's not as much a factor with an agent, but we do like to see them. Like it is nice to see them. I don't put as much weight in them, obviously again, because I'm going to be coming to my own mind about that when I'm pitching it. But some okay. really like it. So it's good to do the homework and good to find that center. And do you think it's good to use a comp of the agent that you are querying? Ooh, that's a good question. That depends on what you're using from them, because if it's too similar, you may run into the rejection of, well, I have something on my list that's already like this and I can't have someone competing with my own client kind of thing. Um, like if somebody is, was writing a, trans romance where the kids run against each other for homecoming king i can't sign that because my client is publishing a book that's like that so i'm like it would literally be putting up competition against my own client um so if it's too similar then that may not be the agent for you in general if it's more of like a vague like maybe the writing style or just the the, the child grandparent relationship 
Like it's more of a vague thing that that's fine. That would be great. Okay. And on that Avenue, let's say you have a writer, an author who has gone to a different agency, but one of the comps that you use in your queries is one of the books that you got published for that writer. Is it okay to use that in your query or no, stay away from that because you don't want, you don't know why the writer left and would that upset the agent and then automatically reject you or what would you? I mean, if that? it's a good comp, I would still use it. If, I mean, we have to set aside our pettiness sometimes, like, come on. Um, if somebody left the agency and decided to go to another agent, I would hope it was on a positive note at least. But again, it's not about the author. It's about the title and the writing style. So clearly I thought that the author was, ta was talented because I agented them at some point. So if you're using that book, there was something good about it. So I would say still use it. If, if, if I'm sorry, but if pettiness is going to be like, oh, then I'm going to feel bad because you used a title of somebody I no longer represent. I don't know that I'd want to work with that person. Exactly. And maybe <laughs> now that that writer's gone, that author is gone, there's a hole that needs to be filled because what you had in that spot is now gone. So you're looking for something to take that spot. Yeah, it could be. they could be looking for the new version of what they, that, that author had brought to the table. Okay. So if you have historical fiction, should you also say if it's commercial or literary fiction yes. in it as well, or just historical is enough? Historical is usually enough um, because for historical, we're really looking at the plot half the time. Um, you can say literary if your voice is less of that, what's the term? the commercial is the term. Um, I think it's fine just to say historical fiction because once we get to those pages, it's gonna be very clear immediately what it is. It's not okay. like like YA contemporary and stuff that if it's literary tone or anything like that, we, we really need to see and know. With historical fiction, I feel like you, you don't have to say it. That wasn't a good example or description, but okay. <laughs> so how can a writer tell which agents work with debut writers? Or is there I mean, a difference? I think everybody does. I think everybody works with debut writers because I mean, a lot of people are debut writers that are querying us. I don't think it's a positive or negative to be a debut writer. Um, and we welcome debut. We welcome people who've had other publishing experiences. I, yeah, I just think, I think most of us are just looking at the story in general and then we'll look at the author afterward. And how does a writer go about turning their manuscript or their MS into a TV series or a movie? Luck. A lot of luck. Um, <laughs> normally the agent is going to be handling that or the publishing company will be. Um, and they will have connections from networking or they'll use a co-agent who is more like in the actual film industry who can open doors that we don't know or knows producers and stuff like that. So we will work with them and split the, the pricing, the commissions. Um, with that person. Um, sometimes when the deal announcement goes up, screenwriters or producers will contact the agent and email them and be like, hey, we really thought this was cool. Can we read it and see if we want to produce it? Which is wonderful because I love when that happens. Um, so it's dependent, but it is a lot of the agents going to be doing most of that work and then relaying the information to you, obviously, so that you know what's going on. And another writer wants to know, would you be able to get input on the casting if it was TV or film adaptation? You might. Uh, it's something you want to talk to your agent about once you start getting inquiries about what would be like your hard no's. Like if they won't do this, I don't want to work with them. And a lot of that ends, ends up being at play when you're talking about LGBTQ or um, BIPOC creations and marginalized authors because they want to make sure. Um, so like if it's a trans lead, the movie should have a trans lead because you want it to be consistent and honoring that identity and being realistic to the book. So you need to talk to your agent about that. But I think as an overall casting situation, you're probably not going to be able to give them a list of, of actors and be like, this is who I want to play it. I highly doubt you're going to be able to do that. Um, maybe, you know, if you become Stephen King or something, but. Or JK Rowling or yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> on Query Tracker, sometimes they ask for a bio. Would that be, would you use the same brief bio that you use in your query? Or would you use something different or take that as a starting point and add to it? I would use the same one in your query. Honestly, if you have publishing credits, add them. That's great. If you don't, you can just use the basic, you know, this is me. I went to this school. This is my degree, or this is where I live with like two dogs and a goldfish. Um, I, it's not something you have to super stress about. And I don't think you need like multiple bio vision or versions for yourself. Okay. So, and in doing that as well, both in the query, as well as in the bio, um, bio on both part query manager and regular, if you have self-published, would you put that in your bio or is that more of a phone call with an agent later? If it's, if it really did great sales, I would mention it. If it didn't, and it was more, you know, you're starting out career, you were younger when you wrote, or, you know, it's a completely different genre or whatever you write. Um, I would talk to the agent about it on the phone. It doesn't need to be in your bio unless it was something that was noteworthy as in you sold a ton and it proves I can carry this marketing backside to it or whatever. Um, if it didn't do well, I don't really need to know about it. And we'll just discuss it when I get on the phone with you and talk. Okay. And when you say did well, what do you consider? They sold a hundred copies. They sold a thousand, a hundred thousand. A lot. You could pay bills with it. Um, I would say uh, like a hundred thousand or like it, it got noticed. It got, a, if you got some awards for it, mention that. Cause that's great. Um, but yeah, if it's, if it's like a hundred to 5,000, I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure there, but it's not that like no, necessary to be talking to us about it until later. Um, so yeah. Okay. So let's say you had a query and it got turned down and you've completely, you've decided to professionally hire an editor. You've completely revamped the book. There were some issues with character development, with prose, with what have you. Do you re-query that agent or do you say, hey, move on and find something else? Because there's I literally thousands of agents out there. I tell people, if you significantly revised it, you did a deep revision, you can re-query me. That's fine. The worst they can do is say no again. Um, and if it's so like, you know, you've really gotten in there and dug deep, I would just try again. Man. there are tons out there yes but if you really like an asian you would love to work with them give it a shot and what is the synopsis <laughs> the synopsis is not the query for one if you copy and paste into your synopsis blank and query manager telling me see above we are no longer ever friends <laughs> um the synopsis is a spoiler document it's literally telling you beginning, middle, and end, and then a couple sentences on how you've merged those main points. Um, it can be dry. It doesn't have to be super voicey. If you can get voice in the synopsis, that's awesome. Kudos. That's hard to do. I don't expect it. Um, I'm really just looking at it to see what happens. Exactly. Because like, and you have to put the ending in. Because if I get down to the end and it shows it's a cliffhanger, but you didn't tell me it was part of a series, I might question that. Um, if you completely change the ending to what it's like, I, like you like you kill off the main character randomly. I'm like, what? Or they wake up from a coma and it's been all a dream. I need to know all of that. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's two pages, double spaced tops. Um, if it can fit on one page, single space it, that's fine. You can have multiple versions because some agents are okay with you having longer synopses. Um, but I think that the industry basic there is that two pages double space because it's long enough you can get a lot of good details in there, but short enough that we're not, you know, bleeding from the eyes with how much we've been reading all day. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so what are the main items that an agent looks for in a manuscript that'll make them want to represent a particular author and attempt to publish his or her books and say, give me the fool? Uh, I think a really unique concept is definitely up there right now because all stories are plays off other stories at this point. So we're really looking for how you have made something your own, how you have brought this unique twist to it. Um, and voice is huge for me. It's, it's not something you can really teach a writer. So they either have it or they don't and, or they grow into it as they have their career. Um, so for me, voice 
is really key because I feel immersed in the character. I feel like it's very fleshed out. It's very 3D um, and I can be transported. It's not just me sitting in a room reading a book um, and like I know where I am and I'm lucid and all that. I love having voice where I can feel like I'm, I'm literally sliding into your story. Um, I think those are key is that we have that voice and we have the unique concept because if there's holes in little other places, we could possibly still work on those. Like I just, I signed um, a girl who has such an amazing, unique concept and I'm so excited. Um, and I love the characters. I really felt immersed into it. And I love the author after talking to her and we're doing a massive rewrite. Like we're, we're overhauling a lot of this story. Um, and not always will an agent do that because again, it's the work level involved. But if they find that right story that is that good, they will take the time for it. Um, so I love finding stories that I feel are like worth the work behind it. Right. And then how do you handle agents that indicate that they only want to accept submissions from writers who are referred? What, what, is, what does that mean? What is a referral? So that's normally like if an agent passes on your work and says, I think so-and-so would be a really great fit, you can give them my name, like that I sent you. Um, that's a referral. It's a little dicey if somebody just says, you may want to look at so-and-so because they could be a good fit, because that might not really be a referral. If you're going to use that as a refer referral, you should mention in your query, you know, this agent recommended I consider you. Because it's so fuzzy, I think agents won't get upset if you say that and it's not really a referral, but hey, it's confusing for writers. So I don't think you're going to get points off for that. But yeah, for me, I usually reach out to the agent um, first and ask them, hey, is this kind of the, I take like the, the author's name and stuff out of there. And I say, hey, is this a query you'd be interested in? This is the story. And if they tell me yes, I'm like, all right, I'll give them your name and I'll tell them that I sent you, I sent it to you. Um, so that's more like a referral. It's not like a, uh, I don't know. So-and-so published a book like this recently, maybe look at them. That's, that's more of an offhanded suggestion. It's not an actual referral. Or I, I, I'm, this is a pass for me. It doesn't quite fit what I'm looking for, but you can try other agents at my agency. Yeah, that's, that's not, not a really referral. a referral. I had someone tell me that. They're like, oh, sh Sharon spoke highly of you. And I went and like, cause in query manager, you can actually go and look at the other queries that your coworkers have passed on and you can see their projections. So I went and looked and I was like, she did not name me. You a liar. And what does that make you do? Go up. Nope. Nope. You're done. Nope. Definitely and don't got, lie. Yeah. I've gotten a lot where they're like, oh, so-and-so editor referred me. And I'm like, I don't even know this person. So definitely yeah, don't I'm make gonna... stuff. And I'm going to say something on this note also. Don't lie. Don't ever, ever lie to an agent because they will find you out and you will blackball yourself. Don't do yeah. it. It's not worth it. It's a small and community. Just, if you get a rejection, you don't have to respond to it. And if you want to respond and say, thank you for reading, that's up to you. But do not ever on social media, email anything, degrade another person, whether it's another writer, another author, another editor, anything, because you may have to work with them again in the future. Yep. And again, know. if you query yeah. one of my coworkers and they see it, they're going to know. Like, it's a very small community. We talk to each other. We look out for each other. So if you get a rejection that you really want to yell at, just delete it and yell into your pillow or something, or go, I don't know, but there's no reason to be answering people angrily or telling them, well, you really missed out, you're stupid. Um, because we get those a lot. And if there's, you just, you just solidified the fact I don't want to work with you. Exactly. So what's a good source for writers to find an agent who um, reps if it's not accessible on their website? So if I want to know what type of um, writers and authors you rep, but it's not on your website, where would I look for that? That's a hard one because I think everybody should have it on their website personally. Um, you can look at Publishers Marketplace. It is a paid subscription, but some people have their profiles public. So like I've listed the names of some of my clients on there and it should be on the public page. Um, if they have a personal website, like a blog or something, they might have it on there or they might talk about it. Um, 
you can look at their published titles, which should be like actually out there. They're definitely on Publishers Marketplace. They could be in Writer's Digest at some point. Um, it's a hard one. And it's definitely a do the research on what the agency itself has put out because like it's not a foolproof system because like at Bel Castro, we all kind of pick and do different things. Um, but it at least gives you some indication if it's not on the website already. But I, I would think that it should be accessible somewhere or manuscriptwishlist.com is a great place for a lot of agents have put their stuff up there saying what they're looking for. Well, and a lot of um, foreign rights when they, when you get that published, there's, it's not listed anywhere. So you may have only had one or two things in the States published this year, but you might've had three or four in other countries. And so that's. Yeah, that's the hard part. Cause that would be publishers marketplace paid subscription. So what that's... do you, what do you expect from your writers? If, um, if you request a full and you offer representation, what do you, re what do you expect of your writer? I expect really good communication because we're all remote and I have a lot of experience organizing and running interns at one point for remotes. And you can tell that you can tell what kind of worker somebody's going to be by the first month of how they're communicating. So I definitely ask them, they expected of me. So I expected of them. I expect them to let me know when things are, what the, what's going on, you know, if they're having struggles and they're going to be late on a draft and that they need to just talk to me so I can make sure they're not burning out. Because again, an agent, they're not your best friend, but they are there to like make sure you're okay. Because um, that's going to affect your writing, obviously. Um, and I expect my clients to really put in the work. If I'm giving edits in that and they don't agree with them, we need to get on a chat and talk about it and brainstorm. And if they are struggling through a scene and they don't know what to do, they should text me and be like, hey, let's get on a video chat and we'll brainstorm. Because I love the brainstorming, honestly. It's so much fun. Um, and I expect them to understand balance of personal and business. So we try to set limits on like, okay, you, you shouldn't be messaging me at like eight o'clock at night. Um, you shouldn't be asking me, checking in about submissions every week because the, the industry just doesn't work that way. Um, you may not hear from an editor back for like six months. It's, it's, like, it's like querying, but worse. <laughs> we could wait even longer than querying. Uh, so I expect them to understand that, you know, there also is some personal boundary there, but they should also be upfront with what they're wanting from an agent. So if I'm not doing something I need to do, I can be aware of it so that they're not just being unhappy this whole time and possibly, you know, looking for another agent because they don't like what we're doing. Um, communication is extremely key for me. And I also always like them to be working on a next work. So if I'm sending one of their books on submission, they should be writing the next one because if, if this one doesn't sell, unfortunately, well, then we have another one to start selling after this one. And if that one gets sold, maybe this one will get sold easier because you're no longer a debut. So there's always something in the pipeline, basically. I'm not an agent who really looks for the one hit wonders where I loved your book, but you're never gonna write anything again. If that's your career plan, I mean, hey, if I loved it, we can do that. But I need to know that's what you're doing <laughs> instead of knowing we want this to be a career length thing. So if you're writing uh, the debut, you're out and you're trying to get it sold with editors and it's in a proposed series. So I'm deciding that I want to start the next in the proposed series while I'm waiting. How far into that book would you write? I would that manuscript? honestly, yeah, I would honestly, so the book one's done and it's on submission. Book two, I think you can have a few chapters, maybe like five chapters written, and then a fleshed out synopsis of where you want the whole thing to go. And if you want, you can also have um, another synopsis for like the third book or the fourth book, like where you want it to go. Because we do have something we call like a, a series proposal template. And it's for every book you plan in the series, it gives like the basic pitch, what your planned word count is, and then the fleshed out synopsis so that you have it all set up basically as far as you can go. Um, but you don't need to have written it because again, if the series doesn't sell, you need to have another work ready to be going on submission. We can't just be selling book one until the end of days. We run out of editors. We run out of people to send it to. And then I'm sorry, but that series is not going to last. It's not going to go anywhere then. Mm -hmm. So you need something different. That's not part of the series 
in case you can sell that one and then your other works may get more attention because you're already a, a, a published author at that point. So now keep... an agent and an agent spends a lot of time with the writer. They really do. And with the manuscript and what have you, can you tell, because some writers don't know how an agent get, gets paid. You're not paid hourly or salary or, and can you go over that really quick just for the ones that don't know? Yes, there are a couple houses that do salary. Um, and normally if you get salary, you're, you're basically saying you don't get the commission um, for the sales you make because you're getting paid. But most of the time, so agents don't get paid until you get paid. So when you get published, we get 15% as a commission. Um, and it shouldn't be more than 15%. There are only certain aspects where it goes higher and that's usually like with translation or co-agents and that's a different thing entirely but we should we get 15 percent, and usually that 15 percent is then also split up between the agent and the agency itself um so your agent doesn't even get that full 15 half the time but that's the only time they get paid you shouldn't be getting reading fees you shouldn't be getting editing fees anything like that they do not get paid until you have been published or have a contract which is why they want you to get published and why they work so hard for you. So <laughs> like you don't make money. I don't make money. <laughs> exactly. So you have to work together to make this get where it needs to go or it's not going to work. And how many agents do this full time and how many have another job? Uh, almost everyone I know has, has another job, at least one other job, maybe two. Um, there are a few, but they've been in the industry a very long time. So they've been upwards of 20 years. Um, and so they can make enough money because they always have percentage of the royalties coming in for stuff they've published. So they always have money coming in. If you're a newer agent, say in the first five years, you're not making much money. You're not making enough to pay the bills. Um, so like me, that's where my freelance editing comes in. And I also work for Eschler Editing. So I technically have two different freelance editing jobs. Um, and then I have agenting. Um, so, and a lot of people I know, they're teachers, they're dance teachers, they are um, they work in IT, they work in, who did I know? Somebody was a dog walker. So there's like, I love we it. all, uh, most of us have second jobs at least. Okay. So how much authority does an author have over his or her work when it is published with a publishing house as Through far as edit. like cover design and, yeah. um, what have you? Through the edits, you're going to have a lot of hands-on experience and say in a lot of the, like developmental editing that goes through the work because you're working strictly with your editor. Um, once it gets down to the nitty gritty of like last minute line edits, no longer do you do more developmental ed edits. Um, you just want the basics because they don't want to have to pay to have the copywriter do stuff again. Your cover, um, it depends on the house. Smaller presses I've noticed actually give a lot of author input they talk to you more, they give you a lot more one-on-one. -on -one. If it's a bigger house, they still give you good information. They may just not have as much wiggle room. So you may be able to, like, they want you to like your cover at the end of the day. They want you to like it. They don't want the author to be like, I hate this cover so much. Um, so they're gonna hear your ideas in that. But normally you're not gonna like have a say in who the illustrator is um, or the, the, the font that happens. And, and if they might change your title and you're gonna have to kind of be happy with that um, they normally, if it's a title change, they're going to work with you on that. Um, that one's a little bit different, but for cover, they're going to like give it to you in drafts form. Be like, this is the idea. Here's more of the coloring. And then, Hey, this is the final draft. What are you thinking? Um, and at that point, you know, you shouldn't be like, Oh, I hate it because you should have told them that way in the beginning, but they're going to be deciding the final cover regardless. That's up to them. That's in the contract. And how many clients do you normally have on your roster? And, and are they all in different stages or are they all in the same area? They're everywhere and everything. I have about 20 on my list right now. And I always laugh because I'm like, it sounds like a huge number. I'm like, but some are more dormant clients and some are current clients that are cranking things out and some are slow writers. So like out of my 20 clients, I have about nine on submission right now. Um, I have a couple others who are not on submission only because they have like three contracts right now. So they have to be making deadlines. And I'm like, stop doing what you're doing. Just work on this because you can't risk obviously missing deadlines or anything. Um, and then there are others who take like a year to write a book or something like that, or they had family issues where they had to move or they had sickness in the family. Um, so it's very, the number of clients doesn't always equate 
the active client. So I always try to embellish on that to people asking me that to clarify what an agent goes through um, because there are two modes of thought. There are quantity and quality for agents. Um, and you, you can have a smaller list of clients that have like rock solid work and, you know, crank it out and are dependable, but you have fewer things going out on submission and selling, or you have a very large list and not everything is like, you're not expecting it to be bestseller. You, you like the book, you believe in the author and they're talented, but you just want to get this author published. You want this author to be out in the world. And if you get big five, that's awesome. And that's great. But you're not putting that pressure on them. If, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. So there's two schools of thoughts. I like the balance of having, you know, half on sub, half working kind of um, elements because inevitably they all send you manuscripts at the exact same time. And you're just like, oh my God, <laughs> I can't read all of these. Alan. So tell us, Caitlin, what is your dream manuscript? What would it consist of? I'm really in the middle grade contemporary right now. I think editors are super looking for it. I've really been enjoying reading it. Um, so I think right now a middle grade contemporary with like BIPOC leads and writer that has LGBT, LGBTQ elements like first crush or something. I think that's what I'm really, really looking for right now. I'm also super, super looking for graphic novel. I really want a graphic novel. Um, because I have two, excuse me, I have two on my list right now, and I'm really looking for a middle grade graphic novel. So I think those are my main things, but um, I'm definitely, I, I also just super, super want historical fiction too, because I love it. Historical fiction. So is there any point of querying a short story collection, or is it best to find anthologies out there that you can put it into? I think both have their merits. I don't know a ton of agents who are doing short story collections. They are out there, so you can find them. And I would sub to them if you can find them, definitely. Um, but it's just dependent. I don't specialize in short stories. So I don't know much about it. Great. And then I have another writer who has written a YA or a young adult thriller. And the stakes are that her main character predicts a global pandemic and is on a mission to prevent it. So she's a little bit concerned about uh, pitching it right now because of COVID, although it has nothing to do with COVID in any way, shape or form. What are your thoughts about that one? Yeah, um, most editors and agents I've been talking to aren't looking for pandemic-y things. Um, illness, like a bio warfare. If they're an agent or editor that really specifies in um, sci-fi, or this kind of thriller, I think it could still be a go. But from what I'm seeing, most people feel it's still not a spot they want to be in or be reading. It's, it's, a, it's a tough one right now. Okay, fantastic. You made it through the questions. <laughs> it's, I do so many of these things where I'm like doing the same questions over and over that I've gotten used to just keep going, just do the spiels. <laughs> is there anything else that you'd like to add for our watchers? No, I think we covered everything pretty much. Um, I will obviously send you my links so that you can put those things up. But, yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Caitlin Johnson, for joining us. For I just your energy, I just love it. And <laughs> um, for being, don't forget, she is available to query as well as she is available for editing for both of her companies. I'm going to let you mention both of those again. And there's one other thing that we need to talk about really, really quick. And that's um, if they pay you to edit, then they cannot query you with that particular work. So I'm going to let you talk about that really briefly. Yeah. So ethically, um, as an editor, if you pay me to edit your manuscript, that manuscript cannot be mine as an agent. You can query anybody else at the agency, but for that manuscript, I can't touch it. Um, I can look at your other manuscripts that you didn't pay me for, but just remember that that's an ethical part, uh, part of, for me is that um, agents should be not accepting money, should not be accepting money to you from you at all like that. So if you do hire me for editing, it's going to be strictly for editing in that, that story. Perfect. And then I'm going to have all of um, your contacts will be scrolling across the bottom while they're watching this, but thank you so much, Caitlin. We really appreciate you. And Again, I just love your energy, um, your expertise, your knowledge is phenomenal. So I'm going to say thank you for watching and remember only you.
can make it a great day.